Homer and Langley Collier were a, two boys of a very wealthy, respected doctor in New York. And the doctor died at the turn of the century. And when he died, he left a fabulous inheritance to these two bachelors. And what they did is they took their inheritance and put it in a house. They bought a house and they just stuck it in a box in their house. Then they boarded up all the windows of this house and they lived there all their life. And in that house as they were living there, there were no lights, no water. They would have to carry in water because they didn't pay their utility bills and so they were soon cut off. And while they were living there, they began to gather trash. Well, they didn't think it was trash. They thought it were treasures. But to the world, it was just trash. And they began to bring it into their house and would clutter everything. So that when the police received a phone call, March 21st, 1947, an anonymous phone tip that somebody had died in this house, they went over and tried to get in, and they couldn't even get through the front door. They had to climb in through the second story window. When they got in there, they were in Homer's bedroom and they found him on the bed dead. He had a magazine in his hand from 1920. The year was 1947. A magazine from 1920 when he had last been able to see. He had been blind all this time. But he believed that sometime he'd get his sight back and so he kept this magazine from 1920. They began to take the things out of this house and it was loaded with all sorts of things. Broken machinery, auto parts, boxes, appliances were all broken down, musical, musical instruments, rags, piles of magazines all over the place. They pulled out of this house. While they were pulling it out, they found the body of Langley under a bunch of junk. Apparently he had died long before that. He had set up a booby trap in case anybody broke into their house to steal their stuff. That this booby trap would catch them while it caught him and killed them. By the time the police had taken out all the junk that filled the house, they had 140 tons of trash. And although the Collier's inheritance was sufficient for all the needs that they had, they lived their lives in unnecessary self-imposed deprivation, neglecting the resources that were rightfully theirs, and instead they turned to the worthless trash of this world, and they lived in that. Now that's a true story. It's a pitiful story. But it's a fitting parable the way that many times we as Christians choose to live. We choose to live that way in our lives and in the church because we do have a rich treasure, a rich treasure in Jesus Christ and His Word. And our relationship to Jesus Christ and the food of the Word of God as we're looking at this morning is all that we need. And the Lord said when He was here on earth that what is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. And yet so often the temptation is to fill our lives and to fill our families and to fill our church with those things that God says are detestable and to forget about the benefits of the valued treasure that we have. And in our search for something more, something to get fulfillment in life, we let the world invade our lives, we let the world invade our church, and we settle down into mediocrity. That is what happened in Pergamum. Pergamum was a city, we find in verse 13, where Satan had his throne. And as you saw in the film, the reason that John is saying that Satan has thrown there was that was the center of false worship of Caesar, of Zeus, and of the snake god Escapulon. And the influences of these particular religions, and you've got to understand this, these religions were well appreciated in that, in that culture. They were not sort of looked at askance by the people in the city of Pergamum. Everybody thought they were great. They were the heartbeat of the town. Just about everybody was involved in them. And it's very difficult for a Christian church to be in a society with such a powerful influence without that influence slowly filtering in or invading the church of Jesus Christ. There is only one defense for that. It's why Jesus begins 
uh, with these are the words of him who has a sar- sharp double-edged sword. We know from Hebrews that the Bible is called a double-edged sword that is able to penetrate the heart. That is the only defense against the influences that Satan can have in our church and in our lives. And some of the people in the world in Pergamum were exchanging the treasure of Jesus Christ and his word for the trash of this world. You look at verses 14 and 15, just sort of gl- get a glimpse of what's coming. He says, Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. And the people right there in the church were reaching out to what the world had to offer in terms of fulfillment, in terms of sexual immorality. And they brought the trash in, just like the Langley brothers did, thinking this was great. And he lost sight of the treasure of the double-edged sword. Well, as we look at this this evening, we want to first of all consider Satan's subtle attacks that we'll look at in verses 13 to 15. But in understanding Satan's subtle attacks, you need to first of all understand the enemy and who he is. I remember listening to General Schwarzkopf as he was talking about the uh, victory in, uh, in Iraq. And he said that the machinery that we had, the technology, was only part of the reason for the victory. He said the main reason is we knew our enemy. We knew his strengths and we knew his weaknesses. And they obviously underestimated his strengths and underestimated his weaknesses, but they knew them. How well do we know the enemy? I mean, so often the Christian church, I think, sort of puts Satan in a, in a category of exist, existing 2,000 years ago and probably not even having an impact upon us today. How well do we know our enemy? Who is he? It tells us here in verse 13 and understanding who he is. He says, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. That tells us something right off the bat about Satan. It tells us that he is a ruler. Let me show you two other scriptures to show where and how Satan is a ruler. If you look with me at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, we find out there that he is the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Ephesians 2, 2 says, In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. It's an ongoing debate that we'll get to a little bit later in Revelation about the uh, question of the millennium. And when you come to the question of the millennium, you come to Revelation chapter 20, where it talks about this thousand-year period, and the capstone or the key to the thousand-year period is it's going to be a time where Satan is going to be bound for the thousand years, but not particularly just bound, though some people key on that. The key is that he's bound so that he will not be able to deceive the nations during this particular time. Of course, there are those who would say that we're in that particular period right now. And uh, that would not be supported by this particular text. Because Satan is not bound so he's no longer able to deceive the nations. He is right now the ruler of the kingdom of the air. He is right now working in those who are disobedient. Look also at first, I mean, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You're talking about Satan being a ruler. That means he has authority. He has certain powers that are far greater than ours, humanly speaking. And then you also look at 1 John chapter 5 to understand this idea of him being a ruler now. One who is active now, he is not bound to the point of not deceiving the nations. But it says in verse 19 of 1 John 5, we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. He is a ruler. And so when John says there, this Satan is on his throne right there in Pergamum, he is a ruler and he has powers over people. Well, secondly about his ruling... He is a ruler that masquerades as an angel of light. And this is what makes him so difficult. If you turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, you understand a little bit better about this particular ruler and how he works. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. A powerful ruler, 
who right now is at work in the lives of those who are disobedient. But he also has his eyes fixed upon the church. Those of you who are believers in Jesus Christ today, he has his eyes fixed on you. He is not happy about the fact that you have given your life to Jesus Christ and that he is on the throne of your life. Listen to what he, 2 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul says. I hope that you will put up with a little of my foolishness, but you are already doing that. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I am afraid that as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And the reason I say this is Satan's work, if you go over to verse 13 or verse 14, he gives us the clue as to how this deceiving can go on. Verse 14 says, No wonder Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. And so to understand the rule, you need to understand that he is a person with power, but he also is a person who is very deceptive. He isn't a man running around with a pitchfork in a red suit with a pointy tail. And sometimes when you hear about Satan worship, and we're just looking right now on the news, and you hear these uh, children who are involved in killing animals, and animals are found all over the city dead and mutilated, and you even hear them talking about Satan worship, and we think, oh yeah, well that's Satan worship. Possibly. But that is not the attack of Satan upon the church of Jesus Christ. He is going to be extremely subtle, so subtle that he deceived Adam and Eve before they had a sinful nature. So subtle, Paul says he is able to deceive you and perhaps even lead you aware away from a sincere, pure devotion to Jesus Christ. Do you know what those two words mean? Sincere meaning single-mindedness and pure meaning just one way. In other words, not all cluttered up with all the trash of this world, but a love of Jesus that is sincere, single-minded, and pure. Well, Satan is masquerading as an angel of light, and he is powerful. So what is his battle plan? You look on the other side of the notes, the back side, understanding his battle plan. You know who the enemy is, just a glimpse. There's a whole lot more you could look at. But his battle plan is to subtly invade the church in order to entice Christians to compromise the truth in life and in doctrine. I like the song that the Academy sang as their last song, that they want to know the Bible. They want to know the Word of God. Oh, I wish that was the heart's desire of every young person in this church and every young person at the Academy and every young person at Covenant Christian School and every young person in the public school and in the homeschooling part of our church. I wish that was their heart's desire. But Satan, who's masquerading as an angel of light, wants to come in and entice us to compromise the truth in our life and in our doctrine, which is why the Apostle Paul and Timothy says, watch your life and doctrine closely. 1 Timothy 4, 16. Watch them. Notice verse 14 is how it was taking place here in Pergamum. He says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Let me remind you of the story of how this happened. Balak, you might remember, was the king of Moab. And he was the king when the Israelites were marching through Moab on their way to the Promised Land. And as they were marching through with their two million people, the king of Moab didn't like that too much. He was there going right through their country. And so Balak, who knew of a prophet, a Moabite prophet, sent money and prestigious men to Balaam and said, Will you come and curse these people? And Balaam said to the men, well, let me go and ask God. He went up to the top of his house and he got on his knees and said, God, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said, don't go with them. They're my enemies. They want you to curse Israel and I don't want you to curse Israel. Don't go with them. And so he came down and he said to the men, I can't go. Sorry. 
So they went back to King Balak and King Balak was told that Balaam would not go with them. And he said, what do you mean he won't go with me? I need him to curse the Israelites. So I'll send more prestigious people and I'll send more money to sweeten the pot. So they go back. Balaam, who was clearly told by God, don't do it, was now asked again. Now it's very tempting when we're told not to do something to ask one more time. That happens so often in our home. One of the girls will come up and say, Mom, may I wear this dress? What is the answer? No, you cannot wear it today. Can I wear it today? Well, we just told you, no, you can't wear it today. Starts going out the door very obediently, turns back. Please. No, you cannot wear it today. Nobody understands no. We always want to press it one more time. So they came back with more prestigious men and more money, and they said, hey, Balaam, we want you to curse the Israelites. Balaam looked at the pot of gold, and he said, well, let me, let me ask one more time. Maybe I didn't hear him right the first time. You know, sometimes these audible voices, you know, not real clear. Let me ask him again. So he goes up top of his house and said, Lord, should I go? And the Lord says, go. This is the same God who he says in the scriptures, I do not change my mind. The Lord says, go. And as he is going, the Lord says, as it's recorded in Numbers, the Lord is very angry with Balaam. And you parents can identify with that. There are times in which you say, okay, wear the dress. I don't want you to wear the dress, but just wear the dress. But God was saying, okay, go. So he goes off. He goes down the road, and as the donkey is going down the road, the donkey veers off into a vineyard. Balaam gets off, beats the donkey. Goes down a little bit further, and he's going down a narrow road, and Balaam gets himself pinched against the wall because the donkey won't go any further, and he pushes his leg against the wall, and Balaam is fit to be tied. He gets off and beats the donkey again. Then they're going down such a narrow passageway that that donkey all of a sudden stops and kneels. Balaam was furious. He got off the donkey and whipped it so hard. And the donkey turned around and said, why are you beating me? Now that might surprise you, but really surprises me that Balaam talked back. He says, I'm beating you because you stopped in the middle of the road. You've been faithful to me all these years. Why are you stopping right now? And the donkey says, well, look, there's an angel who's about to destroy you. And all of a sudden, God gave Balaam the eyes to see the angel with a drawn sword. And the angel said, you are fortunate to have that faithful donkey because I would have killed you had you come further. Well, he goes on, and he goes to curse the Israelites. But the Lord had said to him, go ahead and speak. But when you open your mouth, blessing will come out. And when you look at Numbers chapter 22, it says he blessed the Israelites. He preached again, he blessed the Israelites. Five times he kept preaching, and he kept blessing the Israelites. And then, after that was all over, you might think the story was ended. But if you look at Numbers chapter 26, just right after all this took place, Numbers chapter 25, excuse me, says this, verse 1. While Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with the Moabite women who invited them to the sacrifices of their God. The people ate and bowed down before these gods, and so Israel joined in worshiping the Baal of Peor. How could that happen? Numbers chapter 31, verse 16 tells us, Because I think when Balaam preached those five sermons of blessing, do you think he got paid? No, I don't think he got paid. And that money was still looming really big. And he said, okay, God, if you're not going to let me curse these Israelites, I'm going to find some way to get to them. And Numbers chapter 31, verse 16 is the commentary on what happened. It says, talking about the women who, when they went into Moabite, they left the women live. It says in verse 16, they were the ones who followed Balaam's advice and were the means of turning the Israelites away from the Lord in what happened at Peor, so a plague struck the Lord's people. When Balaam couldn't curse them, he got a group of women together and said, look, put on your nicest clothes and go up to Israel and say, let's have a worship service. Let me show you how the Moabites worship. You want to worship God, don't you? Let's worship God together. You're going to like this kind of worship. And you're worshiping the Baal of Pure and indulging in sexual intercourse. What John says in Revelation is there are people in the church 
who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food, sacrifice to idol, and by committing sexual immorality. Was there a Balaam in the church of Pergamum? No. But we do know that there was influence of the worship of Caesar, the worship of Zeus, and the worship of Ascapus. And in those three things, there were influences that would bring this about. For example, the worship of Zeus, which is a good example of hedonism infiltrating the church. Zeus himself had many wives, many goddesses as wives. And it was a great person to worship because you could do it too. And it could be sanctified. Hedonism was infiltrating the church in Pergamum. So was pragmatism. What I mean by pragmatism is the influence of if it works, do it. The pragmatism was faced with the worship of Caesar. You saw in the film they had to bow down once a year and say, Caesar is Lord. And if they didn't, verse 13 would happen. Do you see verse 13? I know where you live where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Antipas was one who was called to bow before the throne of Caesar and say, Caesar is Lord. And there were pragmatists who said, say it. You can go back then and worship Christ. It's not going to hurt anything. What good are you going to be dead? Just say it. In your heart, you know it's not true. Just say it. Look, he did over there and he's alive. It works. And then there was the mysticism. The scapulon worship began to infiltrate the church where people began to say, oh yeah, you can be healed. God wants you well. And all of these subtle influences came in so that there were those who were enticed like Balaamson and as you see verse 15, also those who have hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. And we do not know to this day exactly what that was. But whatever the case, it was a compromise of these religions that were accepted, these practices that were accepted by the world, there was a compromise with Christianity that began to invade ever so subtly the church of Jesus Christ. Now that's what happened in Pergamum. And I would say to you that those three are still happening to us today here in America. They take on a different form, but they're happening And if we sit here in our chairs and ever think that there's no way that we could ever be enticed and lured away and deceived from a sincere and pure devotion to Jesus Christ, then we don't understand the power of the enemy. There isn't one of us who could say, I could never be lured. Let's look for a moment at just a couple of examples today of how Satan is enticing us. One, the church being invaded by pragmatism. And again, what I mean by that is, if it works, it must be okay. Or the end justifies the means. I was fascinated last week. I was listening to uh, my favorite KMOX show, Ann and Keith, again. And while they were talking, they were talking about the issue of cheating on taxes. And uh, in that particular uh, interchange that took place, I was really fascinated because Ann and uh, Bruce sounded like ultra, ultra conservatives. Didn't any of you hear that program? It was incredible. All these people were calling in and saying, you have to cheat in your taxes. For example, there's one lady called up and said, you know, if you own a restaurant, you're trying to make ends meet, there's no way that you could possibly make it if you report all your earnings. You have to cheat. And Anna Bruce is scratching her head saying, you mean to tell me that you think that you have to? You mean there's no right or wrong? And I'm thinking, Anna, Bruce, where are you coming from? Couldn't believe it. It's great. But all the people calling in said, hey, sometimes you just got to do what it takes to get by. And we live in a pragmatic culture that says, look, if it works, do it. Don't talk about right and wrong. Talk about what you can get by with. And do you think that that does not affect the church of Jesus Christ? The only mooring that we have is the Word of God. Listen to this one example. This is the only Christian um, show that there was, excuse me a second, about a Christian musician.
I read an article about a well-known gospel singer who has been criticized for dressing provocatively and sunbathing in the nude. Her pastor, wanting to defend her actions, said she was only trying to use her sexuality in a godly sense in order to reach her culture. And MacArthur asks, does God need a sexy singer to do what the Bible doesn't have the power to do? The man's comment reflects that many in the church today seem to believe that you have to have an angle to present the gospel of Jesus Christ to a hostile world. And if, God forbid, someone should be offended or reject the message of the scripture, then it means you have failed. We live in a day we're going to be tempted, very, very tempted, to be pragmatic, to say, well, let's see what works. I love how the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, we preach and we do not distort the gospel of God because the gospel of God is a power to save people. Another case of pragmatism. You know my heart's desire to reach the unchurched. I want to do that so bad. And I hope that you begin to catch that vision too because that's why God has left us here. He hasn't left us here to rearrange the kingdom of God. He wants us to reach those who don't know the Savior. And it's very tempting sometimes. And there are some churches now, and it's sort of the rage right now, for people to interview unchurched people and say to them, what makes you not come to church? And they'll list the things that keep them away from church. And the worship service then is built around what the unbeliever wants. It's very subtle. But it's very pragmatic in saying, well, let's see what works. Let's see what brings the people. When you think about it, where should you go to find out what worship is all about? To the unbeliever or to the scriptures? That has to be the foundation. And I think it's very, very important that we be sure to lay down or re remove all the barriers, the unnecessary barriers that we can present to keep people away. But as I mentioned this morning, there are some churches who even remove the blood of Jesus Christ from their hymn books because it might be offensive to people. The gospel is the power of God. The scriptures, if they are taught accurately, are the power of God to change lives. Beware of pragmatism. The second example is, is hedonism. Again, this would be the example of Zeus. Zeus who had this uh, uh, kind of a worship that really focused on the person. And again, it's so easy for that to happen in our culture. Let me give you an example that we could sort of look at a distance and say, oh, that's really bad. You probably have read United Presbyterian Church right now has come up with a study committee who has presented a document for the General Assembly meeting in June. And that study committee has said that they are suggesting that there is validity to adulterous relationships, that it can help to strengthen marriages and that there is validity to homosexual relationships. Now, why is the church saying that? Well, the church is saying that because they've gotten into a position of saying, we want to be people-focused, not God-focused. We want to try to make everybody feel good. And it's so easy in the preaching the Word of God and the teaching the Word of God to avoid the Scriptures, to avoid the truth, to avoid that double-edged sword that will cut right down in the middle of our heart and convict us and make us wounded. To avoid that, to give a message that makes people feel good. Paul warns that in 2 Timothy. He said the day will come in the last days when people will no longer put up with sound doctrine, but they will gather around them teachers who will say what their itching ears want to hear. When I was talking about reaching the unchurched people, one of the people in the college age group came up to me a few months ago. We hadn't even gone down to Twin Oaks yet. And she said, listen, I'm really worried about something. She said, when you're going down there, she said, right now, when you preach the Bible, you tell us what the Bible says, even if it hurts. She said, if you're going to try to reach on church people, are you talking about the fact that you won't preach the Bible like this when you're down there? And let me simply say this. My conviction is that I will continue to preach the Word of God and pray that I'll be faithful to the Word of God and not be afraid to preach the truth of God's Word but I can tell you that the temptation is always there for any minister of the Word of God to say what people want to hear. And it is that subtle influence that is already wreaking havoc in the church of Jesus Christ across America to compromise the truth, 
to be people-focused, need-focused, rather than preaching the Word of God. Let me give you another illustration that was rather incredible. This happened on Christian radio as well. A person who called up to ask a question of a problem that they had. Again, just to show the influence that we have where we're getting so much to be concerned about the individual, not God's truth. I heard a popular Christian broadcast who offered a live counseling uh, program to callers nationwide. A woman called in and said that she had a problem with compulsive fornication for years. She said she goes to bed with anyone and everyone and feels powerless to change her behavior. The Christian counselor suggested that her conduct is her way of striking back as a result of wounds inflicted by her passive father and her overbearing mother. There's just no simple road to recovery, the therapist told her. Your problem won't go away immediately. You see, it's an addiction. And these things require extended counseling. You're going to need years of therapy to overcome your need for illicit sex. The suggestion was then made for the caller to find a church that would be tolerant while she worked her way out of this painful situation and who would tolerate her fornication. And he asks, what kind of advice is that? What would the Lord say in that situation? Again, can you see what is happening in the Church of Jesus Christ, even within the midst of Christian counseling, where the hedonism, the self-centeredness, is just saying, oh, you know, this is an addiction. This is the problem I have, but I can't do anything about it. Look at verse 16. This is what the Lord says. One word. Repent. Repent. That is the beginning of change to sin. And right there in the church of Pergamum, it was happening that as a part of their worship, there were people who had been so subtly enticed by this that there were people who were following Balaam's advice to commit sexual immorality as an acceptable behavior. And I'm simply saying to you tonight, there's nothing different in the church of Jesus Christ today. And thirdly, Pergamum was being invaded by mysticism. Not only a pragmatism and a hedonism, but a mysticism. And that mysticism, as you saw in a scapulon, where people would go through this dark tunnel, mystical, and hear saying, you were healed, you were healed, you were healed. The powerful influence on the radio and TV today of people who are trying to infiltrate such a message is extremely subtle and extremely dangerous. But God warns against it. He says in the last days there are going to be counterfeit miracles. And a counterfeit to be counterfeit has to look like the real thing, does it not? You don't make a counterfeit $7 bill because nobody will take it. You make counterfeit $100 bills. You hear about the school just recently, the school boys who made thousands of dollars of bills and were passing them out? It's great. Worked real well. They made counterfeits. Satan's counterfeit is going on in the church of Jesus Christ right now. We just got a mailing this past week. Full color, beautiful pictures. There were eight pictures in it. The first picture was a picture of a credit card. And I was told to write on that credit card how much I owed on my credit cards. And then there was a picture of a car, and I was supposed to write on there how much I owed on my car. Picture of a house, beautiful picture of a house, how much I owed on my house, and down through all these lists of all my debts. And I was told in the letter that I should write these debts on here, mail them to this minister, this radio preacher. He would lay his hands on them and pray for them, and my debt would be gone. But first, I needed to send $100 seed money for it to work. Now that, when you look at it and say, oh, that's so obvious, that's such a hokey thing, but I'll tell you, there are, there are going to be millions of people, thousands at least, who are going to send those cards in. I know there are. But there are subtle teachings like that, and the reason that they can come, and the reason that Christians can be enticed in the same way it was in Pergamum, is because we have gotten away from the Word of God. What was the way that Jesus Christ overcame Satan? When Satan enticed Jesus, and really they were the same things. They were the same things. It was, first of all, a hedonism. 
the physical needs, saying, hey, turn that loaf of bread. Turn that rock into a loaf of bread. It was hedonism. He approached him with pragmatism, saying, why don't you just bow down to me and I'll give you all these kingdoms. You'll get them someday, but why wait? It works. It was mysticism. Got to jump off that building. God will get you. Same temptations. What did Jesus use to defend it? One thing. What did he use? The scripture. And that is the only defense against Satan's subtlety today. It is the key. There was a pastor a few years ago who was going to be preaching a series of sermons in South Carolina. And he had a friend of his who lived in a city outside of Greenville. And uh, he got picked up by a person that the church was going to be preaching. And the people where he was going to be staying, he said, look, I don't know what time we'll be home, but uh, it might be late. And people said, that's no problem. And off he went. He got back at midnight, knocked on the door. The house was dark. The door was locked. No answer. Knocked a little bit louder. No answer. It's about 35 degrees outside. It was raining. He's getting a little bit perturbed. And he's saying, these people know I'm staying here. Why aren't they here? He knocked a little bit louder. No answer. So they all go next door. Went next door to get the people so they could go in and call the guests. And he got ready to knock at the door and said, whoa, it's midnight. You know, I'm not going to knock on this door. So he decided to look for a pay phone. Pouring down rain, 35 degrees. He's walking down the street. He falls down a little uh, bank into a puddle of mud. He gets out of it. He's cold. He's aching. He ended up walking three miles before he found a pay phone. By this time, even though he's a preacher, he was fit to be tied. He was so mad at those people who were hosting him, he was going to read them the riot act. And he called him up, but just before he did, he remembered he was a preacher and tried to be real nice. And they, he realized he woke him up and he said, um, <clears throat> Remember, I'm staying there tonight. I, I knocked at the door about two hours ago. And he said, oh, don't you remember we gave you a key? And there in his pocket was the key. And you and I have a key to overcome Satan's subtle temptations. And we run around through the muck and the mire, falling down in the puddles, and go through all the trash that Homer and Collier did And we don't remember we have the key. How many times do days go by when we do not even read the Word of God? How many times do years go far before we have ever even read through the Bible? This is the key to overcome the subtle attacks of Satan, to know God's truth. It is what Jesus used three times. And that's why it says here, that Jesus said in verse 12, to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write, these are the words of him who has a sharp double-edged sword. And he says in verse 16, repent therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and I'll fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now think about those words for a minute. What does that mean? Does that mean that somehow if a church is enticed by Satan, that Jesus is going to appear out of the sky with his flaming sword out of his mouth and cut the church down to size? No. But I will tell you this. I know of a man who was called to a church. It was a church that for a while didn't have a lot of strong teaching in the Word of God. It had begun to be subtly enticed, particularly to a very self-centeredness in terms of their life. Very much influenced by counseling where people are basically saying, look, God loves you, and He does. He loves you just as you are, and He does. But the culmination was, well, just stay as you are. It's okay. It was a church that was being lured to sleep. And what God did is He called a pastor to that church who had fire in his bones, who had the Word of God in his bones, who wanted to preach faithfully the Word of God and to teach what God said. And I will tell you this, that the messages were not always well received. In fact, one of the counselors met with a pastor and said, on Monday morning, I meet with your parishioners 
because I have to undo what you did on Sunday. But it's the word of God that restored life to that church because here is the power. It is a double-edged sword. And when it says in verse 16, I will come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth, it is not a negative thing. It is the power of the Spirit of God working through the faithful preaching and teaching of His Word. Jesus comes to His church. But He not only says that, but the Word of God is also powerful in the sense it says here in verse 17, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. And that's the word of God as well. It is a manna that sustains us and strengthens us. I was talking to a young couple one time who was planning to get married. And I was talking to them about the importance of, of reading the Bible, studying the Bible, knowing the Bible, and being a part of Christian fellowship and Christian worship, and being so much a part of God's family to grow. And he said, well, we just really don't have the time to do that. There's so many things to do. We've got to get money to get married and this, that, and the other thing. And I felt as though I was talking to somebody who just didn't understand about the, the hidden manna. Because here is where our strength really is. It isn't in what the world has to offer. And I hope you understand that tonight. And I hope you take hold of the hidden manna. It is that which will satisfy you, but even more than that, it is that which will strengthen you against Satan's attacks. Because if Satan attacks subtly, the scriptures are sufficient as a defense. And we need to remember that the best defense is a good offense to know the word of God and to use it in the battle against the evil one. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, apart from you and your spirit, we are so weak. Like Adam and Eve in the garden, we are so easily deceived by the serpent's cunning words. We live, O oh Lord, in a country where Satan's throne is. And all that was worshipped at Pergamum, though in different dresses, worshipped here in America. Lord God, I pray that you would come through me, through the faithful teachers at Westminster and Covenant and faithful parents and faithful Sunday school teachers, that you would come to our church with a sword of the Lord, bring conviction, bring healing, bring your truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.